When brought in contact, some pairs of fluids mix readily, like water and ethanol, or like any gas with any other gas. However, other pairs of fluids behave differently, as we know, when cooking. Oil and vinegar do not merge, even if beaten with a fork, when preparing a vinaigrette. More commonly, water and air do not mix, even if a small fraction of gas dissolves in the liquid. This absence of miscibility implies the existence of sharp interfaces. Here, we are going to show that such interfaces hold a special kind of energy called the surface energy. So, imagine that we take a large volume of liquid and that we split it into two parts. In this operation, we create interfaces between this liquid and the air which is around. If now we consider two molecules with size A that were initially in close contact, the energy necessary to separate these molecules can be denoted as U. U is smaller for oil than for water, and it is smaller for water than for mercury. U is the energy of molecular cohesion of our liquid. If we want to calculate the total energy necessary to make the divide, we need to count the number of molecules that were separated. If the surface area of each surface which was created is S, then the total number is S over A square, and we just have to multiply by U to get the total energy necessary to make the cut. Since we created two interfaces, this is twice the surface energy of each surface, so that we get a relationship telling us that the energy necessary to create an interface is U over 2A squared times S. This is called the surface energy, and the coefficient of the surface area is called the surface tension of the liquid. For Van der Waals liquid, such as a light oil, U is slightly larger than the thermal energy Kt, so that we expect that the surface tension of oil is on the order of uh, Kt, which is 4 10 to the 20, minus 21, divided by this factor 2 we have here, times the typical size of a molecule, which is a few angstroms. We get something like that for the square. And so this gives uh, 20 millijoule per square meter. And this is what we expect from this very simple argument. And this is indeed the typical energy, uh, surface energy of uh, oil. Water is more cohesive because of hydrogen bonds between the molecules, and so it should be reflected by the value of gamma, which is indeed larger. For water, it is on the order of 70 millijoules per square meters. Of course, if we go to a very special place, which is a critical point of water, we cannot distinguish any more liquid from vapor. Uh, we expect U to vanish, and so gamma should vanish in the same way as U. So this is a very uh, special case where surface tension uh, vanishes. Well, in summary, uh, what we have to remember is the fact that each time we have an interface between liquid and air, between two liquids, between a solid and a fluid, uh, we have a special energy which is attached to this interface. And this energy can be generically written uh, surface uh, area time surface tension, our main formula for all the lessons which are going to, to come. A first observable consequence of the existence of surface tension is the ability of drops to select particular shapes. We demonstrate this by showing a clever experiment initially done by the Belgian physicist Joseph Plateau in the 1850s. 
we have filled a transparent tank with pure water at the bottom and more and more alcoholic water as we rise in the tank. Since alcohol is lighter than water, the stratification in density is stable over at least several hours if we make sure that the tank is not shaken. Now, we introduce into the tank with a pipette drops of sunflower oil colored with a red dye. Each drop falls into the tank until it reaches the position that matches its density. In this gravity-free environment, we observe after plateau that all drops are spherical, regardless of their size. For a given volume of fluid, the sphere is the shape that minimizes the surface area of the interface between oil and water. Minimizing this area minimizes the surface energy, the relevant energy to be considered here in the absence of gravity. Hence, this experiment can be seen as a direct proof of the existence of surface tension. There are other situations where we observe spherical interfaces. In a glass filled with champagne, the small bubbles of carbon dioxide nucleated at the glass surface are spherical, and they remain spherical as they rise in the liquid. On lotus leaves, where water contact is minimized, raindrops looked like pearls with a nearly spherical shape. These general principles allow us to understand the shape of raindrops. Rain is always composed of drops with various sizes, typically between a fraction of a millimetre and a few millimetres. The speed of these drops obviously increases with size, a consequence of the balance between weight and air drag. However, at such scales, surface tension overcomes the effect of the airflow so that all these drops remain quasi-spherical as they fall. Surface energy can be seen as a potential energy. If we look at the coalescence of two spherical droplets, we observe that merging is followed by the jump of the resulting drop. As drops merge, the surface area and thus the surface energy is lowered. This potential energy can be transferred in kinetic energy as seen when we release an expanded spring. The analogy with a spring is indeed valid. The unit of surface tension is joule per square meter, thus newton per meter, where we recognize the unit of the stiffness of a spring. When we increase the surface of a liquid, it is as if we elongated a spring and the energy stored in the deformation permits a motion. However, when drops merge on common solids, such as plastics, we do not observe any spectacular effect because of various dissipative processes that consume the surface energy gained in coalescence. So, what is the energy which is gained in the coalescence? We start with two drops with the same size R. And we end up with a single drop, which is slightly larger, with size R prime. So R prime is deduced from the conservation of volume between these two situations. The initial volume is a volume of two spheres, which is eight pi over three times the cube of R. And the final volume, which has to be the same, the same V is four pi over three r prime to the cube, from which we deduce that r prime is simply the cubic root of 2 uh, times r, which is roughly 1.26 r. So the single drops resulting from the merging of two little drops is slightly larger than the initial drops. So the surface area is not conserved. We start from the surface area, which is the surface area of two spheres, which is 8 pi r square, and we end up with a surface area s prime, which is a sur surface area of a single sphere with radius r prime. And because we know the value of r prime, we can express what it is. 4 pi 2 to the 2 thirds times r square. And so these quantities are not the same, 
and there is a change in surface energy, delta E, which is surface tension of water times delta S, the variation of surface area, uh, which is 4 pi gamma R square times a number, and this number is 2 to the 2 thirds minus 2, a number which is negative, which means that the surface energy was lowered in the process of coalescence. So we can deduce from this equation the typical velocity at which the big drop is taking off. Uh, I'm going here to use only scaling laws, which are laws without the numerical coefficients. And so delta E uh, scales as surface tension times the square of the size of the initial drop. And if I assume, which of course is an oversimplification of reality, that this is purely transferred in kinetic energy, kinetic energy will write rho density times r to the cube, because r prime scales as r, as we saw, times the square of the velocity. And so we immediately deduce the velocity at takeoff. Velocity is surface tension, and this is very natural because surface tension drives the motion, divided by density times r. And this is also natural because inertia opposes the taking off of the drop. And this has to be taken um, at the uh, <coughs> one half power. So this is a scaling law, and in particular, it predicts that smaller drops will take off quicker. And the reason of that is that for smaller drops, the ratio between surface and volume is larger, so that surface effects are more and more dominant, which is uh, something that we are going to see many, many times. Coalescence can be exploited to remove drops from a solid. This only happens on solids which are highly non-wettable, and we show in this movie the behaviour of droplets condensing on hydrophobic nanometric cones on which water adhesion is minimised. This material is cooled at 4 degrees Celsius so that atmospheric water condenses on it. Small liquid nuclei appear and grow until they contact a neighbour, which nearly always leads to the departure of the resulting drop. The movie is a top view where we observe a blinking corresponding to a continuous takeoff of the drops, even at a micrometric scale. This nanofabricated sample inspired by cicada wings thus shows remarkable anti fogging abilities. Conversion of surface energy to kinetic energy is used in nature to expel spores out of the lamellae of mushrooms. A water droplet grows in humid conditions until it contacts the surface of the spore, which it fully wets. This fast spreading leads to the ejection of the spore, which is then entrained by airflows owing to its micrometric size. Surface tension leads to a minimization of interfacial area, hence liquid surfaces appear smooth. However, in systems where surface tension is extremely low, thermal fluctuations are able to significantly distort and roughen the interface. Here, a mixture of fluorescent silica colloids, decaline and polystyrene, separates in two phases. One black, rich in polystyrene, and one green, heavier, rich in colloids. Even just under a microscope, we see that the interface is rough and fluctuating, from which we can deduce a surface energy one million times smaller than usually. When a green drop falls in the black phase and meets the green bath, the coalescence is triggered by the fluctuating nature of the interfaces.